What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. Kicking it off. Kicking it old school. Old school. All right. You're in for a treat today. I know we were when we spoke to this fine gentleman out of Phoenix, Dan Cushell. This guy's amazing. He, I don't even know where to start, but essentially, <laughs> if you want to think deeper about your business and systemize a lot of the stuff, it's not, we're not just talking like tools and tactics and blah, 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 but like real deep thinking and ways to like reframe what you're doing in business, you are in for a treat for sure. Absolutely. So this, this guy that we're talking to, Dan Cashel, he's started over 11 businesses, exited a bunch of them, some of them for eight figures. Mm-hmm. Um, he goes and helps tons of other business owners do very similar things in their business and helps build systems and helps grow these other businesses. He's got a podcast, a killer podcast called Growth to Freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, he, this guy is just on top of it and doing some really enormous stuff in the world. Yeah. I mean, he's just amazing. And- and we, we just go down a lot of paths, but really the impact is, at least for us, in our experience, is the three questions he brings up. And these are three questions that Dan uses when he's approaching things in life, essentially. But there are three key things that he pretty much lives by. And hint, it's not make more money. <laughs> <laughs> so those questions are going to be uh, asked, uh, not really of you, but I highly recommend you jot those questions down. They'll be in the show notes and we'll have you know uh, ways that you can, you can basically dive into this. But essentially, do the work. And he actually challenged Matt and I. He's going to follow up with us in 10 days. So our butt's on the line. Mm-hmm. But these three questions are super powerful. And, and actually do them and spend some time because... Trust me, I, I feel like this is going to reverberate into a better business for yourself. You'll work a lot less and you'll be happier. You'll Speaking of working money. less, yeah, there's a tool called Gen M. Your segues are beautiful. I know, I suck at these segues, huh? <laughs> no, there's a, there's a tool called Gen M that we really, really like. If you go to evergreenprofits.com slash Gen M, you get a nice little discount. But basically what Gen M does is they help you find apprentices. They're kind of like interns Mm -hmm. to come and work on marketing tactics in your business. Things like creating content, running your ads, uh, doing SEO, things like that. They will come and basically do them in their business, do them in your business. And Gen M sort of pre-trains them on these skills. And it's just a really, really cool service. We're using it in multiple areas of our business. And we've recommended it to tons of people who are now using it in their business. And uh, you definitely got to go check it out. Evergreenprofits.com slash Gen M. You'll dig it. You'll dig it. And uh, let's go talk to Dan, because this is just an awesome conversation. Just get ready and get that notebook ready. Hey, Dan, we're live. How you doing? Doing awesome, guys. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, it's... uh, Let's see. We met back in um, what, New Media Summit in Austin, Texas a few months back. And that was yes. A- yeah, what a blast that was, right? It was cool. Yeah. And, and I love the mastermind at the end. That's kind of where, what, the 40 of us gathered and, and just kind of talked shop, set some cool goals. And yeah, just... It was just a good event. It was a whole week, so it was like immersion, you know? Yeah, you actually said yes. something at that mastermind after the event that actually had a pretty big impact on Joe and I, but we'll mm. get to that later in the show. <laughs> it was cool. just like a brief moment on the way out of the door, I think, when you're leaving. I was like, ah, we need to get him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's cool. So are you going to be at the next uh, New Media Summit? Yeah, in February. I'll, I expect to be there, God willing, mm-hmm. and... Uh, you know, it's a great group of people. Steve puts a great audience together, and uh, you know, I think there's a great way we can help contribute. Right, hundred percent. Very, cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to miss the February one, but the, when he does the San Diego one a few months after that, we'll be back at that one. It will happen. Yeah, sure. tough life you guys have in San Diego. You guys are beach dwellers. You get to hang out with guys like Roland and guys like Steve, Steve. regularly, bi monthly. I mean, yeah. what a crazy world you live in. It's a hor- <laughs> horrible life we live in these crystal blue skies. And, oh, man. I mean, Phoenix isn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not terrible either. <laughs> no, you're, good. you're good. You're good. Nice. Well, catch us up because we, we don't know. Uh, we know kind of on the fringes of what you do and, and what you have done. But catch us all up and, you know, what brought you to this point where you're at now? Yeah, well, you, you, you know how a lot of uh, you know, business owners, guys, uh, entrepreneurs kind of struggle with getting a steady flow of new clients, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially as it relates to running like paid ads, either online or offline. What we do, what you know, our superpower is, is helping business owners and entrepreneurs implement to be able to 
get a steady flow of predictable leads or sales or clients coming in, uh, leveraging you know, paid media, referrals, create, and creating systems so that the business owner can work more on the business and do it with actually with, without more staff, without more stress, and definitely uh, in a place where it's predictable. And uh, so we have a lot of fun. My, you know, my very first business, I, I got started in the early 90s. <laughs> so I've been doing this a while. And I got started because I got introduced to direct response marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, a direct mail is what it was back then. And I got so fascinated, guys, about you know how you could put like message on a piece of paper or put it in a radio ad or put it on a TV ad, which is what we were doing back in the late 80s. And put that message out and people would respond and literally respond fairly quickly, Mm -hmm. directly was why they call it direct responding, uh, direct response marketing, and actually buy your stuff. And I I got obsessed with it. And I started learning. I got several coaches and mentors way back then. And then I started my first company in 1992. And since that time, I've had 11 companies. And today we get to work with all kinds of experts and influencers and thought leaders or whatever and help them grow and scale with less stress. So it's a lot of fun. Wow. So 11 companies. So is that, did, did you purchase some of those companies or did you actually found 11 companies? I founded 11. I've also bought companies and then also been fortunate and blessed to sell a few companies along the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, out of the 11 that I founded and started, I crashed three of them. So I had to bury three of them in the backyard, <laughs> if you will. Uh, so I've you know, been fortunate to learn from some of those mistakes and then we've had a few of those that were, you know, high seven figure companies, couple eight figure companies and uh, have bought and sold companies along the way too. Very cool. Was there any sort of uh, uh, trend among them? Was there any sort of theme among all these companies or were they just completely different in- industries and testing out different things? Well, I, I'm fascinated to test new things. Uh, but there are a couple industries that a lot has carried like some similarities. So mm-hmm. in the coaching industry, the publishing industry, consulting, right? These are some of the niches that we've been able to you know grow, scale, and then help our clients really uh, expand. You know, fitness, nutrition companies. Um, those those are kind of what I would describe as our sweet spot um, because most people in those areas struggle to a degree with their messaging or being positioned. You know, there's like, for example, one of the greatest lies I think that misleads a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs is this old way of looking at communicating, you know, this idea that you must get people to like you and what? Trust you. Mm -hmm. And people following that old way, I think it causes problems because, you know, the reality is people don't buy from us per se because they like us. They buy from us and the new way of really adapting this is they must trust us and respect us, right? Mm -hmm. So in other, what does that mean? It means that we have trust and we have authority at the same time, right? And it's that new way of really, you know, creating assets or branding, or you could even call it direct response branding to position ourselves in the marketplace, to package ourselves in the marketplace, to then promote ourselves in the marketplace to create our following, to create our impact, to have a bigger reach and a bigger contribution. Hmm. That makes sense. So how would you, how would you then approach that? How would you create that authority and that trust? Well, there are all kinds of ways to create authority and trust, right? Mm -hmm. One, it's just being a good human being. That is (laughs) also a a big help. (laughs) right? (laughs) So, uh, so there's trust there, having a good product or good service. And then how do you position yourself unique? You know, I love this quote from uh, Sally Hogshead, and I'll paraphrase it, which is it's better to be different than better, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you can be better, great. But here's the problem with shooting to be better. How many companies in your niche as you're listening right now say they're better? Like everybody, Mm -hmm. right? So by going at it from the perspective of trying to be better, you're actually you know, putting yourselves at risk of being commoditized. So instead, why not position yourself to be unique or different? Mm. And then if you can say you're unique and better, it gives you that double, double right, left, cross, <laughs> right, right, left combination yeah. that creates power. So that's a start. Uh, the, the other thing is, 
is really getting clear on your irresistible offer. And again, there's a lot of depth to this. I mean, we could spend days in an <laughs> event together sure. and, and not scratch the surface on this. But you know, if you're gonna if you're brand new and you're listening to Matt uh, and these guys in their show, I would encourage you one: how do you position yourself to be unique? Number two is how do you create your irresistible first your irresistible message and then your irresistible offer. So, so guys, would it be all right if I gave an example of like how I got my first company started? Hundred percent. Go Let's for do it. it. Yep. Yeah. So, like, if you guys were business owners, right, or a health club owner specifically. Um, you know, again, this is all the way back in 1992. So if you guys had a health club and it was independent, wasn't franchise owned, and you guys were kind of a mom and pop in that area, we'd come to you and go, Hey, Hey Matt, um, you know, if I could guarantee you that we'd help you add 200 to 300 new clients in the next 90 days or less, and it won't cost you anything up front. My company will risk and we'll run direct mail for you, we'll run TV ads for you, and we'll run radio ads for you. And then when we profit from the sales, then we'll split the profits on the back end. Would you want to learn more? Absolutely. Sounds sexy right? to me. <laughs> I would love yeah. to see some case studies, maybe see how you're going to do it roughly, and then go forward. Yeah. Right. And so what that is, is an example of an irresistible offer and an irresistible message, hmm. right? So, you know, as you're listening right now, what could you do to package up or position an irresistible message or an irresistible offer that essentially gets seven or eight out of 10 people that are your potential perfect ideal clients to go, yes, I want to learn more, right? Doesn't mean mm -hmm. that you're going to work with them. It just means they want to learn more. And now you have to go through, that's the next phase, which is client selection, right? Um, here's another common mistake that we see. Um, people having a misunderstanding around marketing and selling. Right, and I've I've learned this combination from uh, two guys who I've one is a, has been a client and another has been a mentor, which is uh, Gary Halbert, the late great Gary Halbert, copywriter, mm -hmm. uh, and Joe Polish, who runs Genius Network, and so they're framing around the difference between sales and marketing. Right, so as you're listening right now, like what would your definition of selling be? Right, or let's start with marketing. What would your definition of marketing be? And there's all kinds of definition. Years ago, when I first got started, marketing was simply putting a message out to get people uh, ready to buy from you. Mm -hmm. It was that simple, right? It's a little different today, right? See, back then in, in the 80s and early 90s, when I got my first business started, you literally, if you could look at your marketing, you could strike a match, call that your irresistible offer and message, throw it in the fireplace where there are logs, and you literally could catch a fire. In other words, people would buy your stuff in droves, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd make have an immediate ROI, many times very quickly. Mm -hmm. Today, because buyer culture has changed, behavior has changed, more educated consumers, now when you strike a match and throw that match in the fireplace, many times you, don't, you, don't, you get crickets, right? You don't yeah. get a fire. So what is the approach? Does that mean marketing doesn't work? No, it means what you've got to do is you strike a match, you light a piece of paper, you get a flame going, then you put some kindling on that flame, then you get some sticks and put on top of that kindling. Now you got some heat, you got a little bit of fire brewing. Now what you do is now you walk over and put your log, right? Mm -hmm. So what is marketing today? And th this is adapted from Gary Halbert and, and Joe, which is, you know, marketing is what you do to get somebody uh, pre-qualified, pre-motivated, pre-interested, and ready to do business with you when they're on the phone or face-to-face -face with you. Here's another way you could look at it. It's like field position in football, right? So like my son, guys, uh, he's now 12 or uh, 11. My daughter just turned 13. So my son is now 11. And so let's say there was a kickoff to my son and he catches it at the goal line. And of course, a, a traditional field is a hundred yard field and he returns it f five yards, and then he gets smacked and hammered and tackled, mm -hmm. right? So he went five yards, now he has 95 yards to go. So let's put it in context of business. So in this example, his marketing got him five yards. So then what has to happen to take it the other 95 yards in the business model? Selling, right? And today's business climate really frowns heavily on a, a selling culture, what would happen if you would shift your model to become more of a buyer's culture and how you can do that is effective marketing, right? 
So another way to look at marketing is, is uh, marketing is storytelling, right? Those companies, uh, those brands, if you will, that tell a better story about their business or about their founders or about their people, about the buying experience, the breakthroughs, the outcomes, the transformation, the experience are the ones who compel more people and build a bigger following, build a bigger impact or reach and contribution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so now let's flip it to, to sales. What is sales? So years ago, selling, you know, I learned from one of my early coaches, what is uh, selling is simply helping people, right? And I still believe that to be true today. But if we tie back into uh, Gary and Joe's uh, definition, the context of it is, it's what you do when someone is face to face with you or on the phone with you and they're pre-qualified, pre-motivated, pre-interested and ready to do business with you. Now go back to that football field position. So imagine like, you know, Matt, let's say you catch the ball at the goal line instead of my son, mm -hmm. right? You're a little mm -hmm. bigger and stronger than him. You make a cut, you take it down the sideline, you make a juke, you take it 35, 40 more yards and you get tackled at the op opposition's 20 yard line. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you took that kickoff 80 yards. That's your marketing. You've taken it 80 yards. Now you only have 20 more yards to go. What does that mean? You have less selling to do because the marketing created that field position, that authority, that respect and trust, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so today, how can you go out and shift from the risk of a, of a selling culture and have the reward of a buying culture. The great companies like Apple and, and Starbucks, if you think of those two companies, you know, they're not selling us their stuff. They've created a buyer's culture. Well, every business today can create their own version of a buyer's culture by effectively using the new strategies of, of what we're talking about with marketing and selling combined. And that's, that's what we help people do. I like it. Would that, would you say that's almost like creating a little ecosystem, like building a moat around your stuff like you know your media your content your products your offerings and your your all that marketing is just bringing them into that fold over the moat and giving them yes. a little bridge to bring them into this thing where you can then do the selling absolutely great God. great way to be thinking of. i might borrow that one as well <laughs> yeah it's all yours that's my a, man <laughs> yeah no no that that's a is great a, analogy. a great way to view it and you know and there's you know, not to get too far into tactics, here's another mistake we see a lot of people make in their business. They fall in love with tactics. Oh, let me go run Facebook ads mm -hmm. and let me go run, you know, Instagram ads. And then those things all work. But if you focus on the strategy first, right, and what the purpose of the strategy is and, and why and what you're looking, things come and go, right? Today, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people complaining at the time we're doing this interview that Facebook costs have increased quite a bit and more than doubled in the last year compared to generating a client a year ago. Right. I predict that it's more going to more than double in the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. Right. So the people who focus on strategy can adapt with that. They're flexible. They're innovative. They can move to other platforms and still maximize that opportunity. Right. And talk about creating a great moat around the thing. Basically, it eliminates your competition when you really really get the strategy of this, then the tactics just become an arsenal, yeah. right? And when one tool in the toolbox is no longer valid, you just shift to another tool in the toolbox, mm -hmm. or you have a series of tools working. And as one become obsolete, you can double down on the others that are working. Yeah, no, I love that so much. I mean, basically, once you have the fundamentals and you totally understand the why of everything you're doing, why you're running Facebook ads the way you're doing it, why you're running Google ads, then the, the tool doesn't matter as much because you can move from tool to tool and use the same, apply the same philosophies essentially. Exactly. And, and hey, let's give a quick example of like even just a simple applicable way that this probably shows up for almost anybody every week of every year, right? Mm -hmm. How many times have we gone to an event, guys, where you know someone asks you or me, like, what do you do? <laughs> right. Or you ask somebody, right. And you go, sure. Hey, what do you do? And then the person on the other end, they like fire hose us with like a five minute overview of what they do, right. And how they <laughs> right. help people, which is great. Right. Well, yep. one little, like, and again, it's not inaccurate to take that approach. Like, uh, you know, and even give like the t traditional, the old style elevator pitch. Right. And you can do that in like 15 seconds valid. But what if there was a better way? And this is a simple strategic move that allows the tactic of an elevator pitch to work better. And then you, you can extrapolate this to 40 or 50 other 
strategic and tactical moves you can make in marketing and selling. So instead of the next time someone asks you, as you're listening right now, well, what do you do? And you go off into your well, pre well prepared, you probably have it well thought out, you've probably followed these guys' approach and some of the other experts have and give a great elevator. But by just making one little three degree turn, like, and here's an example too. Uh, th how big of an impact does three degrees or four degrees make? Well, when I was a kid, guys, my very first car was a, a, a used Plymouth Horizon stick shift. Oh, right? wow. Hmm. And it was, you know, this was a car in the 80s. So, you know, when I'm talking about a stick shift, it also meant your timing belt had to be manually adjusted, right? Mm -hmm. And if that timing belt in a stick shift was off by even like one or two degrees, the car would stall, mm -hmm. right? Yep. If it was off four degrees, it actually wouldn't even run, right? Mm -hmm. So, so similarly here, this three degree to four degree turn in how you might approach someone even with an elevator pitch once the next time someone asks you, well, what do you do? Instead of fire hosing them with your, again, well thought out, probably by the book elevator pitch, add a question instead of an answer. In other words, whatever it is that you do, think of your client. What is the big problem that is the big problem that your clients face? Now, for my clients, my clients face the big problem of getting a steady flow of clients coming in every day, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm asked today, and, and I'm going to use my example, not because I'm beating on my chest, but I want you to, as you're listening, view how you can turn this into your method the next time someone asks you. So here goes. So someone says, well, Dan, what do you do? Well, you know how a lot of people struggle to get a steady flow of leads coming in every day? What I do is, and then you give your 20 seconds. So instead of answering with an answer, ask a question. And what will happen is if you position the problem the right way, mm -hmm. they'll lean in and go, oh, yeah. And either they're saying, oh, yeah, that's me, or B, they're going, oh, yeah, I know somebody who struggles with that. And mm -hmm. that, oh, yeah, connects you to the audience that's versus them putting armor up and or they're nodding their head but not really listening, mm -hmm. right? It's a total and connection. So just, yeah, and you open the door that way. Yeah. And you open the door, right? So, th so that's a simple way uh, that almost everybody could experience today or tomorrow uh, because most business owners are going to have somebody say, well, what do you guys do, right? And I would train your team this method, ask the question first, and then go into what it is that you do. It has a huge impact in responsiveness. I love that. Now, I want to. I actually want to go back to something you said actually towards the beginning of this call because I, um, my my brain for some reason has been spinning on it, and I want to I want to get your take on it. But <laughs> you mentioned you know you were, you're talking about the no like and trust thing. Everybody says you got to get customers to know like and trust you, but one of the pitfalls is they put a little too much focus on the like. So I'm curious what sort of pitfalls come from focusing on getting people to like you versus um, getting people to respect you. Sure. Have you, have you ever known somebody to be a people pleaser? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite a few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll speak to me because I I've had a chance, had a tendency in the past to be a people pleaser. And what does a people pleaser do in most small businesses? They create a lot of customized options. Mm -hmm. And what do customized options do? It means you as the business owner are wearing 12 hats all the time. You're basically a slave to your business. You can't duplicate it. You can't scale it typically, right? So behaviorally, it creates, a, we'll call it the success traps. Now, do I agree to some degree about the idea of no like, and trust? There, I believe it's a half truth. I just think it needs a broader range. And that's where the trust respect comes in, mm -hmm. right? To have the authority. Because, you know, think about it this way. Um, like, have you guys ever been out at a restaurant, Right. And you're with somebody that, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a partner, a friend or whatever. And maybe you got into a little bit of a, a heated exchange. Maybe you could even say it's an argument, right? Mm -hmm. And you're in the restaurant and you're in that table and you're kind of heated in the moment you're talking. And then the waitress walks up. What do you do? You stop. <laughs> you stop out of respect. Yeah, right. Because you don't know them, right? And, and you don't want to look like a like a douche tart or whatever. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> True. So, so, so you have respect for someone you, you haven't quite met yet or you don't know their status or that sort of thing. But there's high trust between you and the person at the table. And when they walk away, you might dive right back into that needed <laughs> exchange, right? Yes, yeah. So as trust increases, right, comfort also goes up, right? Mm-hmm. 
But what happens with respect, people trust people that or I'm sorry, they respect people they don't completely know. It's like I'll speak to, about my wife. And this is just a sad truth about most relationships. As time goes on, respect, you know, can decrease a bit, right? Uh -huh. Think about, you know, like I, I've been known to leave the toothpaste cap off the toothpaste, right? How so my, my wife, God bless her, she doesn't get upset about it. She just makes sure she has her own toothpaste and I have my own toothpaste. Right. Yep. So, so she doesn't argue about it at all, but, but there's that trust respect. So when mm -hmm. you can have the magic of trust and respect in a potential uh, business or influence relationship, that's where you get mag magnified results. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's creating, creating both. Now does likability or knowing somebody have some, something to do with trust. I, I do think it does. I think reputation can play into that too. But give me trust and respect in a, in a potential business relationship, and I'll show you how the results grow. There's something called edification, right? You know, as you're listening right now, you know, have you ever gone into a conversation and felt like the person on the other end of the line was just expecting you to go into a big sales pitch? Hmm. And they had their armor up and they had their guard up and they had like all this baggage and they really weren't listening or connecting to what you had to say, right? Maybe we've all had that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you had a like, let's say theoretically, depending on the size of you, but you had an assistant, just send out a preface message, a pre-framing message to that uh, person coming on to an appointment with you. And it said something like, hey, uh, you're going to be meeting with Matt and... Uh, you know, I just want to let you know your time is at such and such. Matt is a definitive expert and, uh, you know, he probably won't even say something like this, right? But, you know, he's helped grow multiple businesses and, you know, helped interview hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, from world leaders to, uh, you know, uh, athletes to celebrities, right? Mm -hmm. And I imagine you guys are going to really hit it off when you get a chance to speak, right? So, Matt, in that example, getting that third party endorsement, and I made some of that up, of course, but mm -hmm. getting that third party endorsement about something true, right? Mm -hmm. And edifying, what it does is it positions Matt in that example as a trusted expert, right? Mm -hmm. He's got trust and respect from the other party, ideally creating a little bit less friction in the conversation. Oh, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I, from my experience, you know, we've tested this in companies where we went into some companies and we actually taught, uh, helped them implement this edification strategy for their account executives. And it boosted results two, three, four, and five times. We've had wow. companies where they took people who are customer service people, they created this, we call it the edification breakthrough method, put this in place for even customer service people to follow up with their, you know, potential client candidates or prospects. And they started making sales hand over fist, hmm. right? Non salespeople becoming salespeople and, you know, creating, you know, opti optimizing the growth and so on. Just on this idea of the trust and respect being uh, framed. Here's another way to think about it. it, it Maybe the tactics I'm sharing are a little too fast, too quick. And, you know, maybe as you're listening, you're like, oh, I kind of get it, but I don't. Here's another way to think about it. Um, if you get a painting, right? And let's say, let, let's just say it's a Picasso, right? Whether you're into art or not, just bear with this ex example. Mm -hmm. um, if we get a Picasso and, and it comes in a tube and I unroll it, and then I go basically put duct tape in the corner of that Picasso on my wall, that's one way of framing. On the other hand, if I go out and I get a professional framer, and I don't know what it would cost to do it, but let's say put a, a beautiful frame, the lighting around it, maybe I spend a couple grand to set it up right, the lighting, the place, the location, and so on. And now we put that Picasso on the wall, it's received a whole lot different, mm -hmm. right? So the trust respect is really, you know, a, a authentic, genuine framing strategy to help open people's hearts and minds to connect with who we are, to give us both the best chance to help each other. Mm. I think that's that's amazing, and and you talked about the uh, the likability factor, people pleaser. Like I know I have been guilty of that in the past, especially it, um, when you said the multiple options for offers. Yeah, you know, when yeah. you're selling someone on the phone, it it 
and I know a lot of people that have uh, slipped into this, but it's almost too easy to just create an offer on the fly that is outside of the systems that are in place. Yes. <laughs> and uh, definitely, I want to say we got screwed by that, but we definitely caused a lot more stress in our lives. Um, it didn't well, lead I'll to say good that things. in the past when I've made that mistake, I will say I've gotten screwed. <laughs> we have. I guess we have occasionally, but usually we spin it around. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it's... And if it wasn't for Matt, he's a lot more of the systems guy. I am more of the, you know, kind of let, let's chat, let's figure things out. Um, and the trust is a big piece because I feel like what I have been told by others that know me pretty dang well is, you know, you have the likability, but the thing is there's trust because there's follow through. And a lot of folks who are the likability or they're throwing options out there don't really do what they say. I think yep. that's, a, that's a huge part right there. Without that, yeah, you could be likable, and I could see that being even worse than not likable. Yeah. So it's that follow through is huge. Yeah, I, I like my my volleyball analogy. I, I'm the setter, you're the spiker. <laughs> I'm uh, <laughs> I'm yeah, basically yeah. doing all the systems to get people aware of us, and then you go and close the deal once people are already aware and they have that respect and trust factor in the business. Yeah. But um, yeah. I I love that. It's great. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank cool. you. Huh. Yeah. And so, I mean, what you're doing there is just building all these systems. It seems like you're spotting these, these almost like blind spots that folks can't see themselves, you know, maybe with yep. your clients. Is that something that you're kind of looking out for? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, one of my gifts and superpowers, and then we've got a team that helps implement a lot of these things is we help connect the dots, see the blind spots, and really you know, a simple framing is get unstuck around some of these areas because so many people are just that like, it's two degrees off, three degrees Mm. off, you build a, you know, an edification model or, you know, you have a whole sequence of strategies and tactics like we just went through. Like another popular one right now that we're helping with is like, we call it the mini series breakthrough traffic strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can really duplicate what Amazon has done and duplicate what um, Netflix is doing in your own small business, right? And create a mini series uh, method inside it to create trust and respect and authority. Like for example, literally you could go in and create a one minute video. You don't even have to be on camera, right? And you could create a message, consider it like a one minute educational entertainment video uh, and provides value and it could drive to say a, a short article. But you create this one minute video it could be what's called a kinetic video. And what that means is just like text on the page, kind of flashing in, flashing out. You can find you know, a lot of different freelance sites to do this for you, right? But create this one minute video and then go into Facebook and target certain audiences, certain behavior, certain interest groups that are your perfect clients, age, demographics, et cetera. And in your area locally, or you could even do this nationwide. We've done this with multiple clients. Like one of our HVAC uh, we have an HVAC client right now, a very large company on the East Coast, and we're driving hundreds of leads a month for them mm-hmm. uh, for appointments for, for their team to go out to. But one of the strategies is this mini series uh, video method. And for literally less than 10 cents a view, actually, it's closer to two to three cents a view, we're building up, like in a few weeks, we can build up an audience of perfect potential clients based on income, based on interest, based on behavior, based on location of tens of thousands of people, Mm -hmm. right? And you can put one video and then based on how much they watched of that video, you could put another video to kind of move them down the path of trust and respect with you. And then after they viewed, let's say 50% of the video or 50% of two videos, now you put your irresistible offer and because your trust and respect, they feel like you're everywhere. Oh my gosh, man. Oh my (laughs) God, Joe, I see you guys everywhere, right? Yep. That's a simple, literally for pennies on the dollar uh, for your perfect client. So that, that's, that, that's a way uh, that you can also apply some of this in you know, real terms using the technology that's there right now. Yeah, no, it, it's super smart. It, it, that's actually, you pretty much kind of described our main marketing strategy right there of using short Facebook videos and bringing people deeper and deeper down the funnel based on percentages of the videos they watch and things like that. We actually have a really great podcast episode with a guy named Kurt Molly who sort of breaks that process down step by step for anybody mm-hmm. who wants to go figure out how to actually build that. But um, it's it's really, really, really powerful. So when you're working with your clients, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, so the HVAC company, 
Uh, are you doing that kind of setup like you described back in your direct marketing days, you know, with paper? Are you going in there and kind of essentially getting a piece of the company? I, each company or depending on which program they're in, um, we have a different path. So that particular company, they're a private client. So mm-hmm. not only do we have a fee-based model per month, but we also get a performance bonus based on the results of what we actually create. And then after we've hit certain uh, criteria, then there is a ability to have like either an equity ownership or like a profit sharing opportunity in the companies. And that's typically the way we like with, with the private clients. And these right. are typically clients that are doing in excess of a million a year in, in business already. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can help them double, triple, quadruple their their uh, top line revenue, and many times exponentially grow their bottom line. Uh, so that's the kind of our, what I would describe as our perfect client scenario: a company that's looking to grow and scale. They're at a million or more a year. Uh, they want to you know grow upwards of ten. Add part of our criteria is like well, a question we'd ask: Do you really have the drive and desire to grow your company at least ten million dollars in the next you know two to three years? Mm. right from where you are right now and if they say no well then for that program they're not really and we have other things that we can uh, suit them for but for the private client relationship where we were working with them as an advisor almost like their outsourced uh, marketing team Mm -hmm. right we help drive the implementation and we'll you know we'll actually script the videos we'll uh, create the video campaigns. We'll run the traffic and different things like that. Again, because we do have a high upside of, of interest, the performance bonuses, et cetera. Yeah. Mm, cool. Yeah. Thanks for breaking that down. I always like to kind of dig into a business model just for the listeners to <laughs> kind of get some ideas of what to try. Yeah. And then our other uh, model that we suit for companies under a million in revenue, which let's face it, that's the majority, right? We have a, a small group uh, program that we work with that allows us to scale. We maximize it where it's high, high touch and highly personalized. We limit it to 14 um, companies uh, each session that we do, but we literally walk them through our eight, eight step formula of how to be able to attract clients, how to be able to convert clients, how to be able to maximize it with paid traffic, and then how to optimize it, you know, optimize profits in the company, right? Which, of course, you know, truth is, it also creates the opportunity correctly that they can transition to become more one of our potential private clients, right? Yep, so it can yep. be looked at as a feeder system. But that model, we even you know write their video sales letter for them, right? Um, which you guys know what you know a lot of the experts are charging, and that mm-hmm. program is geared again for the small business at a million or under, and or you know they're still stuck with uh, you know their digital marketing and things like that. What we do is we allow people our full fee for that program is you know right around $12,000. But I'm so confident in our methods that we allow people to start with a small deposit of 25%. And then only after they've increased the results eight times of that deposit, then they pay the rest and only then. Mm, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah. So, wow. Okay. So I have a question for you that's um, totally stolen from Steve Olsher and the Beyond Eight Figure podcast. Uh, yeah. But I'm going to give him a shout out, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so one of the bullets on there was that you talked about the three key questions that you use to base decisions on. And I'm curious if you'd oh, yeah. be willing to dive into that for us as well. Totally. This came at a place where I, um, you know, I ended up in a hospital a couple of weeks after my son Kyler was born. Uh, with chest pains. I had built up a company that had done a lot of business and we had 175 employees through three offices plus a bunch of outsourced people. And um, we were doing well from the business side, but I woke up you know, with these chest pains, ended up in the hospital, came out of that experience. And you know what, what I would say, I, I couldn't tell if it was Joe or Matt who asked the question. But, that was Matt. That was Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was at a place of you know really making a decision of where I wanted to go next. So I hired a, another coach. I've always had coaching. I believe in coaching and consulting. I've probably invested in close to a million dollars in my education over the years since 1990 something. And um, my coach got me to really focus in on three critical questions that now ultimately every decision I make has filtered through these three questions. It's so critical. As a, as, a, as a framing and a starting. Why, and why it's important is because I don't know. I, I don't know about you guys, uh, Joe, Matt. I, like I've at times made poor decisions based on how I felt about things versus like 
making reality based decisions. Right. Sure. Uh-huh. Now, All the time. You know, sometimes being an entrepreneur, it's a gift and a curse because you know we can take opportunities, right, and make uh, even a bad opportunity get some kind of momentum out of it. But our time is best spent with opportunities that are on an eight, eight to a ten, on an eight to a ten, on a ten scale, and then taking them to the next level. And um, so I, I was at a crossroads. I was, I was, uh, you know, in this health crisis. My coach sat down and said, "Hey, um, what do you want?" And she had me write this on a piece of paper. And this is the first question: is identifying what do you want. Not what do your kids want, not do your spouse want, or your best friends, not do, you know, if you have hundreds of employees or it's just you or anywhere in between, but like, what do you, and maybe even add the word really, really want, <laughs> mm. right? And, you know, get clarity around that. And I, and I, you know, I, I shared this at Steve's event, I think guys, right? And uh, mm-hmm. when I, when she got me to ask that question, I sat there, I wrote one answer on the piece of paper and I stared at it for the rest of our session together. And then I went home and she said, work on it. And I went home and I was supposed to come back the next week. And I was so embarrassed because I hadn't gotten past one. I didn't go back the next week and I didn't go back the following week and I didn't go back the following. It took almost a month for me to kind of get unstuck here and really get clear on what did I really want, right? Mm -hmm. And I came back and I had a list and we talked through it and we, you know, isolated then what was important, what was most important, right? We put a a hierarchy of those items of, you know, from least important to most important. Then she had me go to the second question, which is, you know, what, uh, or who are you? And it got me to look like, you know, give her a blank, right? Imagine sitting in this office with your coach and you, you know, she says, well, what, who are you? Hmm. And you look at her like, like, I don't even know, like, I, <laughs> right. That's how, that's where I was, you know, like 12 or so years ago. And I sat there and I didn't take me four weeks on this one, but it took me, you know, half the session to kind of get unstuck on this one. But what she got me to understand, you know, don't look at the labels, don't look at the titles, don't look at all those uh, false um, things that you, you've named yourself by or known yourself for. Rather, think of it, who, who are you as a human being, not the human doing stuff? Mm. Right. And that was the first Mm -hmm. time I'd ever heard that term before, which she shared with me, you know, about 12 years ago or so at the time we're doing this. And I got a lot of clarity on like, who, who am I? Right. And then the third question is, what do you stand for? And these are kind of, these are like your core values as a human being. Right. So we hear all the time, you know, as a company, you have great core values, narrow it down to your three to five, you know, core values. Right. My company, we have a set of core values based on this acronym uh, called Champion. Right. Mm-hmm. Or I should say my family core values are based on this acronym called Champion. Like if you ask my 13 uh, year old and 11 year old and you said, hey, Kira, what are your what are your what are the Kushel values? They would go choose health, action, mastery, purpose, invest in yourself, be an opportunity seeker and never quit on you, which is the acronym for being a champion. Mm-hmm. C-H-A-M-P-I-O-N. Right. In our company, we have three core values. The first value is related to growth. The second is related to teamwork. The third is related to uh, contribution, right? So when you get clear on your values, then what's most important is not what you do, but it's what you say no to. The no list or the not to do list becomes way more important (laughs) than the yes list or the not to do or or the to do list. And so so those three questions now, like even being on your guys' show, right? is filtered through these three questions and how it fits. And, you know, for me, this was like a total easy yes. The impact (laughs) you guys are making, what you guys stand for, right, in in alignment, right? And so, you know, as you're listening or, or, or hearing this, what would happen for you if you sat down and got really crystal clear on, like, what do you want, right? Mm. Yeah, that's that's power. I, this is this is probably some of the best uh, work. Having that- 175 employees is awesome. Having uh, the ability to impact a lot of people is great, but yeah. I don't want 175 employees. So, like two years mm-hmm. later, I actually set the stage, and it's really a big part of the choice of what led me to sell my companies and exit. Well, that's what that's what's fascinating is I remember you yeah. mentioned that in the mastermind, 
And I think that is what really triggered to us or, you know, that, Matt and I weren't even sitting by each other, not even talking, but you were leaving the room. And I think you were saying that you sold your companies and, you know, you talked briefly about your time in the hospital, kind of the health scare there and the wake up call, really. And then yeah. you, that was your shift. And then it was basically simplicity, but big impact still. Yeah. Well, to, to sort of set the scene a little bit, we were sitting in this, this mastermind and we did this little exercise where we, we sort of went around the room and everybody said, okay, this is my goal. This is my earnings goal for 2019. This is what I want to make in the year of 2019. And we went around the table, everybody threw out their numbers. Um, the, the numbers aren't important, but the number that you threw out Somebody asked you a question as you were walking out the door. You had to leave early to catch a plane or something. And somebody said, yep. you know, I noticed you've had so much success. You've exited these businesses. You've, you've just been wildly successful in your career. Why is your goal number lower than what you've managed to achieve in the past? And the, the, and I, I believe you pretty much ran us through that, that, that same concept that you just explained. But that, that, that message was super impactful for us after mm -hmm. that event. Well, I'm glad, I, I'm glad to hear that. You know, a lot of people are chasing, I, and I won't speak for anybody, I'll speak to me. At times, I've chased growth just out of the desire to grow mm -hmm. versus, you know, the, the impact of it, right? Like my focus right now is I want to build a, have a great business and continue to build a great business while also being incredibly available and present with my kids, mm. right? I don't want to be one of those dads that like when they ask their kid, oh my God, what was your dad like? Well, he was great at business, but he was never there for me, right? I'm fortunate and blessed. I, I, you know, I have all this, you know, I'm fortunate to have all this background and some results. I was blessed to be able to exit and sell my companies and, you know, these sorts of things, the relationship capital, which is the most important capital any of us can have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it gives me some leverage and flexibility and I, you know, and I get to coach like my son's football team. I'm able to be at all of his practices three, four days a week, attend all of his games, nice. right? Because of the way I've structured my businesses and still run a very high profit, high impact business. So everybody's going to be a little, you know, the biggest thing I, I'll, I'll share the trap that I was in that kind of led to this. So I forget which one of you guys mentioned it, Joe or Matt, about simplicity. If I had to narrow it down to like, what's one word of why? It's simplicity, mm. right? And it's also what I want, right? It's not what the outside wants. It's not like, you know, I've had many of my friends ask me the same thing, like very close friends that if I mentioned the names, you, you, most of you would know these people and they'd be like, so like, why are you like, you had built this $25 million a year company and expanded over time and done over a hundred million dollars. And you're, you're essentially, compared to that, running a small business. Well, don't let the small business confuse you with us being small-minded about impact mm. because the small business is having a huge impact. Through the different businesses we're able to impact, their reach is in the tens of thousands, right? Hundreds of thousands, if you really calculate, probably close to millions with the different uh, companies that were working with to help them grow and scale and have a bigger impact too. So, but the key is, is what do you want? Like, what is it for you? What will you say yes to? But what do you want to say no to that's non-negotiable, right? If I have, you know, the, the, uh, of course, there's no such thing as an absolute, like a ne I'll never do this or I only do that. But the guide, these are guard, and part of this is me knowing me, like I'm an addict by nature, guys. I... Mm -hmm left of my own devices. I'm a workaholic that would easily and can easily work 20 plus hours a day mm -hmm. for years. It's great. Return of the choir. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that's a, 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 a DNA trait of most entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. It can be a gift and it can be a curse. And there's a time to, 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 that it can be used, but it also can be something that can hurt us. So for me, it's like, how do you create, I don't believe in balance either. Like a lot of people that, well, you must like really strive for balance. No, I think balance is bullshit. <laughs> right? yeah. You know, I believe integration is critical. So like when I'm able to be with my son in practice, like literally I'm not just showing up as a, like an assistant, like volunteer coach. I'm practicing with my son. Like I'm on the field running routes. I'm on defense when he's playing quarterback, oh, trying cool. to knock passes down for him. Right. Like I am there and I'm engaged. Like it's, it's being active and, you know, 
uh, there's all kinds of abilities, either as the business owner, entrepreneur, or that we look for in our team. And one that rarely gets discussed is this ability called availability, right? What is your availability? But again, it comes back to being clear on these three questions. What do you want? Who are you? And then what do you stand for? And then it just allows you to make decisions in your heart that are the right things. And, you know, not comparing yourself to others, right? That which is also a gift and a curse of many entrepreneurs. That's huge. Right? And allow you to stay true to you, your values, and, you know, the impact that you're meant to have and that, that uh, gift that you're, you're taking out to the world. Love it. I can't think of a better note to, to go ahead and wrap this discussion up on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we really, really thank you for the time you've spent. I do have a couple super quick questions. Yeah. Um, the first one being, do you have any books that you tend to recommend often or you find yourself revisiting often? Oh, yeah. I've got, I've got several. So uh, one that I love recently is uh, written by a friend, uh, Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Mm-hmm. Not only is it about negotiating and how this ex-FBI agent uh, negotiated high stakes and techniques and strategies, but it's really about just better communication, right? Better communication flow. Even for me, it helped you know being a better dad, communicating with my my now thirteen and eleven year old kids, my wife and spouse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's one that I highly recommend if you haven't checked it out. Uh, another uh, another book that I reference regularly is tested advertising methods, mm-hmm. which I love going back to that one because it's you know got some of the, the basics, but yet some of the basics are still very advanced fundamentals today, strategies that just work. Um, and, and so you can find both of those, I imagine, on Amazon. But those are two. And then another one I would throw out there is Think and Grow Rich, mm, uh, which is a classic by Napoleon Hill. It's awesome. like a solid foundation right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Now, where should folks go and check all your stuff out? I know you're doing a lot and we didn't even touch on your podcast, which we t- normally do, but uh, I know you have a great podcast as well. Well, well, thanks. Uh, you know, short version, if you want to check out our podcast, we've got you know over 200 hours of insights, wisdom, strategies from uh, a lot of experts on a variety of business topics to help grow and scale with less stress. And that's at growthtofreedom.com. Uh, growthtofreedom.com. We have an on de- a free, 100% free on-demand training that we rotate uh, that you can go get the latest version of that on, on helping you generate more leads or a steady flow of clients, some of the strategies and techniques that we're using right now in real time. You can check that out at championbusinessblueprint.com. Perfect. And we'll link everything in the show notes uh, at evergreenprofits.com. You'll find it all there. Cool. Dan, this has been awesome. And I... I'm definitely going to think on those questions for a while <laughs> and they probably will take some time, but uh, it's super impactful. So thank you for well, sharing. I, I would love to hold you accountable. So like, Please. Can I, how about if I check in with you in like 10 days or so Deal. and uh, I'd love to hear how you've progressed or if you're stuck somewhere, I'd love to help you make sure that you're not stuck because I know what a difference this can really make and, I'm, and I'd love to be there for you. Very Let's cool. do it. Yeah. Matt, Joe and I are both big journalers, so we've got to... Uh, you know, we've, we've got the medium. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll expect that 10 day email. <laughs> Thank you, you Dad. Putting us on the fire. <laughs> All right, Dad. All right. Take care, man. All right. Thanks, guys. You got it. All right.